and unfortunately, so far, it's a fail. But I still have hope for it. For this. Okay, so I'll start with an example, the cluster category of type AM, which is very easy to describe combinatorially. Uh, then present the results from cluster tilting theory that I would like to reinterpret. Uh, talk a bit about homotopical algebra, just give the basics of model category, and then explain the, my main results. So. seen in previous talks, uh, cluster algebra, some cluster algebras have a nice description in terms of triangulations in Riemann surfaces. And the, the easiest example is type A, where one only looks at triangulations of a, of a polygon. So, for instance, type A4, you would look at some And now the clusters, the cluster variables of the cluster algebra of type A4, which are the generators of the cluster algebra, correspond to diagonals in this polygon. <coughs> so, for instance, we have these arcs correspond to generators. And the clusters of the cluster algebra will then correspond to triangulations. For instance, this is a triangulation of the polygon, and it would correspond to some cluster in the cluster algebra. Uh, now, if you pick an arc in the triangulation, you can flip that triangulation. So you have the arc alpha to get new triangulations. And the way to do it is first to remove alpha from the triangulation and then you're left with the, the two triangles spliced together and replace alpha with the other diagonal you get here. And this corresponds to the mutation in the associated cluster algebra. So uh, this should be thought of as a combinatorial description of the, the formula uh, that Kirby gave like alpha alpha prime equals some sum of two monomials, which I'm not describing here. And then <coughs> the cluster category uh, is, can be described in terms of these arcs. So the indecomposable objects will correspond objectively to the diagonals of the polygon. And to describe morphisms, I need to write down a quiver. So we are linking 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5, 1 to 6, written here. And then just, just increase uh, step by step. So here we have 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, 2, 7, and so on. Uh, 1, 5 is 2, 5. 2, 5 three, six, three, seven, uh, and then from seven we're back to one. So here we get one, three, <coughs> four, six, four, seven, again one, four, then five, seven, one, five, and one, six. So this part here appears again here. So they should be, be glued together. And now uh, link these vertices with, arc, with the arcs, with arrows, in order to get the quiver. And this 
a picture we've seen in Alfredo Stoke already. Um, okay. Now the cluster category is an additive linear or the some algebraic field category. Uh, since it's additive, it's enough to describe the indecomposable objects. All objects would be unity decomposed into direct sums of these. So the indecomposable objects are in bijection with the arcs of the n plus 3 go. So right xij for the objects corresponding to the diagonal between i and j. <coughs> and the morphisms are uh, given as follows. The morphism from the object associated with the arc ij to the object associated with the arc kl it's the direct sum, uh, I mean, it's the vector space with basis all the path in that quiver from Ij to Km. Modulo <coughs> the mesh relations. So, I've had already describe the mesh relations. In that specific example, it just means that all the squares commute. And on the, on the boundary, every composition is zero. So here, the compositions are zero. Okay. So you can compute explicitly the dimension of the Spaces of morphisms from one object to the other. For instance, from uh, say 2, 4 to 3, 6, there are two different paths, this one and that one. Because the square commutes, they correspond to the same morphism. And this composition being zero, this morphism is zero. So there are no morphisms from 2, 4 to 3, 6 in that category. No non zero morphism. So the projection you're using yeah. is with respect, I mean, you fix a triangulation for now, or not? Uh, why, why it's one three? Right? It's just one a diagonal. You could, just yeah, let's say, you, you might fix the triangulation of circles here, yeah, one three, one four, one five, one six. But, uh, oh. It's independent of a choice of a triangulation. Mm. And so this category satisfies all assumptions of Kelly's talk. Yeah. If you want to go from A4 to AM, you just increase the number of uh, yeah. the number of sides of your polygon. So for, for C A M you must take an N plus three go. So C A M so it satisfies all, all the assumptions of Kelly's term, so in particular it is triangulated. And I will make use of the, the triangles. Um, and the, surf, the, the shift, the suspension functor is easy to describe. So the suspension it just sends uh, an object on that quiver to the one which is just to its left. So it sends xij to x i minus 1, j minus 1. This is an automorphism of the category. This gives an automorphism of the category. And then we've got this easy exercise which uh, describes the extensions in the category in terms of crossings diagonals in the picture. So we've got that the arcs IJ and KL cross 
we can only give uh, there is a non-zero morphism from xij to the shift on xkl in the category. So that the can define a rigid object. X is rigid. If it has no extension, so there is only a, a, a zero morphism from X with the suspension of X. <coughs> Meaning that it corrects into a collection of non-crossing parts, non-crossing diagonals. And X is said to be X is a <coughs> just a TLT object. So if it is rigid and maximal with this property. So I'm not being very explicit on that definition, but uh, it's easy to picture on the left hand side here. If you take a maximal correction of non-crossing arcs, what you get is a triangulation. So cluster tilting objects correspond here to triangulation. Objects, there are two different descriptions of the module category. The first one is due to Yamayoshino, and the second one to Brian Marsh. So, <coughs> again, let's see the first category of type AN, or more generally, it could be any infinite Goldschmidt. Triangulated category uh, with a stair pointer. And then pick, pick a rigid object T in C. Uh, I need some, some notation. All right. T star sigma T would be the full subcategory of C whose objects satisfy the following. So they are part of a triangle T1, T0, X, sigma T1. 
These are the objects which are finitely presented with respect to T. So in a module category, we would ask something like a subjection here, and T0, T1 to be projective, and this is the analog of that assumption in the cluster category. Okay, and so now, that is not by Iyama Yoshino. that, uh, again, quantity blank induces an equivalence. Categories, but now, not on the whole category C, but on that full subcategory T. So, sigma T. The module category. Okay. So that's the first description. So we can still recover the module category, but first restrict the subcategory for killing the shift of T. Uh, and the second description due to Ryan and Marsh uses a localization. So let me quickly recall what localization means. If S is a class of morphism, you can see, then a localization of C at S. It's a functor which is a, a solution to some universal problem. So it's the datum of a category with a C bracket S minus 1 and some functor from C that's possibly an S, which inverts all morphisms in S. Well, image is an isomorphism in the localized category and it's initial amongst all such functors. So G is a functor from C to D which inverts all morphisms in S. Then there is a unique functor which extends G from C to the localized. So there is the unique G bar such that the triangle commutes on the nodes. So Gabriel and Zisman describe the way to construct this category for any choice. Of S, uh, but there is there are some set theoretical issues to the existence of, of this category. So one needs some some more assumptions to make sure that the category exists. We'll see some examples of assumptions. Okay. Uh, so now in our setup of the first categories, now we pick for S the collection of all morphisms in C such that when we complete the morphism to a triangle H um, the morphism G and the morphism H both factors to through some object which is right after the long to T here, T per 
means objects which only have the zero morphism from T. So these objects are sent to zero by the functor from T blank. And the results of Graham and Marsh. Following, so we recall you that T, T is rigid. Then, first, uh, home T blank inverts all morphisms in S. that it induces a functor from the localization C bracket S minus 1 to the module category. Mm -hmm. And this induced morphism is an equivalence of categories. So you can assume for all the terms that C is a crystal category of type AM, but uh, it works for any finite which needs a related category with the serpent. analogy a bit far further uh, because here in that setup there, there are no home finite assumptions at all so this might be a nice setup to prove the same theorem for home infinite cluster categories so let me say a few words on modal categories So the first theorem that you state is a special case of this theorem one and Marsh, or it's a real one? So the first theorem, when you portion by Morphy's factor, you uh, Yeah, you can recover it from this, yes. You, you can recover from this? Yeah, yes. What, has, what is S in that case? Uh, in that case, it would be, well, the same collection. Ah, the same collection. Yes. Definition, 
to assume that it has finite things and codings. And it is given with a class, a specific class of morphisms that we want to invert. So typical setups are C might be a category of topological spaces or simulation sets. W would be the class of weak equivalences. That's the but it could also be the, the category of complexes of modules over some ring, and then W would be the class of quasi isomorphisms. So both setups would fit into the setup of model categories. And now a model structure on C. Would be the datum of two more classes of morphisms. Called co vibrations and vibrations. Satisfying some axioms. So I'm not recalling all axioms here. Uh, some of the axioms are concern some stability properties of W, cough, and field, and some of the axioms describe how these three classes interact with each other. Uh, so I'll give two examples as examples. So the first, first I need some notations. So we write x squared g and say that f has the left lifting property with respect to g, or g has the right lifting property with respect to f. If For all commutative square of that form, there exists a non necessarily unique lift H, which makes the diagram commute. So HF equals U and GH and GH equals B. Do you require H to be unique? No. Uh, it, it's not unique in general. Oh. <coughs> so the say, things three would say that uh, all maps which are both co-fibrations and weak equivalencies have the left lifting property with all fibrations. And similarly, all co-fibrations have the left lifting property with respect to vibrations which are also weak equivalencies. And axiom <coughs> 4 says that uh, there is factorizations for every morphism. Factorizations. Uh, so if you pick any morphism S, in your category, uh, it should be possible to factor it out into a co-fibration, which is also a weak equivalence followed by a fibration. So this means fibration, and this means co-fibration and weak equivalence. But you could, you should also be able to factor it out as a Co-fibration followed by a fibration which is a weak equivalence. Now, with this setup. Um, Define homotopy. So first, the homotopy category of C will be the localization of C at W. 
which will always exist under the axioms of a model category. Let's see. Uh, then an object X is called cofibrant uh, if the canonical morphism from X to I'm oh, sorry the canonical morphism from the initial object to X is a cofibration uh, and this means that X behaves like a projective object with respect to Vibrations which are weak equivalencies. So this means that for any vibration which is a weak equivalence and any morphism from X to B, there exists a lift. Well, as in that picture, so it behaves like a projective. Dually, X is fibrant. It behaves like an injective. So the morphism from X to the terminal object is a vibration. <laughs> and the full subcategory we're interested in is the subcategory on object which are both vibrant and cofibrant. So C, C, F will be the full subcategory of C whose, ob whose objects Okay. And it is then possible to define the notion of homotopy between morphisms in the category C. results of Kudan. Which is that if C is a model category, then uh, for any objects X, Y, which are cofibrant and fibrant, homotopy is an equivalence relation on morphisms from X to Y. Compatible with the with composition. So one can define the subcategory the category of cofibrant and fibrant objects with morphisms up to homotopy. This is a well defined category. And Quillen shows that this category is equivalent to the homotopy category. So the inclusion <coughs> CCF into C induces an equivalence of categories. From CCF up to homotopy. We would like to describe T star sigma T as a subcategory of cofibrant and fibrant objects, killing sigma T as 
looking at morphisms of pleomotopy and the localization that can be considered by Grand Marsh as a <coughs> pleomotopy category. And it's possible to do it, more or less. This works in a more general setup where C could be any time related category. So with a contravariantly finite rigid category. So in a, in a model category, vibrations are exactly the morphisms which have the right lifting property with respect to all co-vibrations which are weak equivalences. So that's a way to define vibrations. But then to check if a given morphism is a vibration, it's not necessarily to check the right lifting property with respect to all co-vibrations which are more weak equivalences. It's often enough to check for some of these. And that's, that's what I do here. So I pick some co-fibrations which are weak equivalencies. So I decide that this morphism should be one. So the morphism from 0 to the shift of t. And I also pick some co-fibrations. So this will be all morphisms of the form R to A. Like R is in at t and A in T star sigma T. And having in mind that these should be co-fibrations and weak equivalencies and these co-fibrations will define the class of fibrations to be all the morphisms which have the right lifting property with respect to morphism J. W phi it should correspond to vibrations which are also weak equivalencies. Be, uh, morphisms which have the right lifting property with respect to morphisms in I. And thus, more vibrations will be morphisms having the left lifting property with respect to these ones. that this almost defines a model category structure we see. Lot. 
and the seven reason for the appearance of the most is that uh, there is only one of the two factorizations in general. So any morphism <coughs> so it can be factored out as a Vibration, which is a weak equivalence followed by a vibration. But the second factorization has a, only exists in a restricted form. So X has to be cofibrant. This morphism is a vibration, which is a weak equivalence, but that one is only some weak version of the vibration. Yeah, it's a weak version of the vibration. Okay, good. It's not a real problem because the, the theorem of Quillen applies in that slightly modified setup. <coughs> so let's say a bit more on the modern category structure. First, all objects are fibrant. Then the cofibrant objects Exactly those we want. So X is confinement if and only if it belongs to T star sigma T. And then uh, any two morphisms between fibrant and cofibrant objects are homotopic if and only if their difference factors to add sigma T. Thus, as a consequence, the category of cofibrant and fibrant objects up to homotopy is uh, all objects are fibrant, so the only restriction needs to be cofibrant. That's T star sigma T mod out by sigma T and by equivalent. It's like the modified version of this proof is the equivalence with the homotopy category, which by definition is the localization considered by Grand Marsh. So we recover the equivalence between the category studied by Iyama Yoshino and the one studied by Grand Marsh from the point of view of homotopical algebra. Uh, just to conclude, uh, this does not apply as such to home infinite crystal categories because I need a contravariantly finite rigid subcategory. It's not contravariantly finite in general. Uh, but I've got still some hope to modify this statement so that it includes home infinite crystal categories. And the uh, second comment is that I think the almost should be removed by slightly modifying the setup. Uh, the triangulated category C should be replaced by some exact Frobenius category. So, for instance, the orbit categories that have been described uh, by our federal instance. That should be a, a setup which is more suited to study model category structures. So, in that setup, one might construct true model category structures. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions? I do have one. So, in, uh, so this result of one of, of, of one Marshall item is a generalization of what happens in classical field theory. If you quotient by a simple projective, and then you get the module category. Uh, but uh, in that context, in a classical context, does it apply this model category approach? And does it give? 
uh, is it known in that context? Um, no, I haven't thought about it. Um, I don't think there is any description in terms of localizations in the classical context. There is. Uh, no, I don't think no. so. Oh, right, right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, that might be another approach. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, I was wondering because the, when you will pass to, I mean, in the, if everything works for infinite, uh, mm -hmm. on infinite uh, cluster categories, let's say, uh, with the condition that the quiver of T is infinite would be a problem for your setting? Uh, the quiver of T? Mm. Well, I don't. I don't think so. You don't think so? I mean, for instance, this applies to the acoustic category of type A infinity. Yes. So that, okay. at least for locally finite infinite okay. quivers, there shouldn't be any problem. Okay. okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Yeah? Yeah.